Hello, everyone. My name is James Faulkner. I'm a technical marketing for Red Hat, uh, focusing on app servers and uh, developer tools. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, fat jars, and we're going to compare and contrast a couple of popular uh, fat jar technologies and frameworks that utilize fat jars to deploy applications uh, onto your, into your production environment. So uh, we'll look at Spring Boot, uh, Eclipse Vertex, uh, Drop Wizard, and Wildfly Swarm. So how many of you have heard of fat jars before? OK, good. Well done. Um, so uh, fat jars, I probably only need this slide. They're easily portable. They're easily runnable, especially in IDEs. You specify the main class, and it loads it up in the JVM, and off you go. And you have all your dependencies inside the jar file. You have no downloads. You have no initialization of, of app containers. It just runs. Um, everybody supports it. Uh, it's been supported actually since about 2011. Drop Wizard was the first. A lot of people think that Spring Boot uh, kind of Spring Boot kind of popularized the use of fat jars, but uh, actually Drop Wizard was first. So uh, kudos to them. Yes, thank you, Burr. Um, so essentially, everything is packaged in a single jar. All your dependencies are resolved at build time, so that at runtime, you have no resolution required. Everything's there. It starts up relatively quickly, and you can't run into problems where, oh, I can't find this, this jar file or this other dependency somewhere else, and the thing fails at runtime. That's the last thing that you want in production. Um, if you're using uh, Linux containers, like for example Docker, um, everything in the fat jar is in a single container layer because it's actually in a single file uh, put into the Docker container layer at the, in, using your Docker file that you build. Um, and so that also means that when you change one line of code in your 200 megabyte fat jar, the entire 200 megabytes gets recreated and re-added to the Linux container layer. Meaning, if you then redeploy that uh, container image out somewhere else, all 200 megabytes are transferred over the network and stored in your S3 bucket in AWS, and that is reflected in your AWS bill. So, uh, a couple, or one uh, prime example of this um, is a company called HubSpot. They do marketing automation. Uh, HubSpot started building fat jars. Uh, they have over 100 developers doing a number of commits per day probably a couple of hundred pushes to production, uh, and they were using fat jars. Every single one of those developers was building a fat jar and pushing that into their corporate repository every single time they did a build. Every time they did a deployment, every single one of those megabytes in their fat jars were being pushed out to their, their nodes. Um, this resulted in, with a one to 2,000 builds per day and a couple of hundred production pushes per day, they were generating around 100 gigabytes of new bits per day. Now you can imagine 100 gigabytes times the, the cost of storing, computing, and uh, transferring that across the network resulted in a huge AWS bill. Uh, so they started to look at some alternatives and started to get away from fat jars. Um, and they came up with a homegrown solution where they built their dependencies independent of the application itself push those dependencies out to Amazon, to S3, and then when the, when the application was deployed to production, it would pull those dependencies and cache them locally so that all the applications deployed on that particular node could reuse those same dependencies locally and not have to pull those dependencies down. So they essentially created a homegrown solution of what Spring Boot, Wildfly Swarm, Vertex, and Drop Wizard do today. So I'm going to show you some of the standard tools that you can use to kind of essentially recreate what HubSpot has done using supported technologies from, from Red Hat. Okay, so in a typical Docker container, if you're, using, if you're not using containers, this doesn't apply to you, but for Docker containers, they are built uh, up by a number of layers. So when you build a container image, the first thing you do is you add an operating system, the user land bits from the operating system. And you can see that down here, uh, this is using CentOS. It's around 190, almost 200 megabytes. The next layer up is Java, so the JDK, or the, the Java runtime environment, uh, with all of its dependencies, all of its tooling, all of its compilers, all of the things that you need to run a Java application is in that next layer up. Uh, that comes out to be around uh, 200 megabytes or so. Then the, the top layers, there's some, so in this case we use, this is an S2I build of a Java EE application 
Uh, S2I is a technology uh, in Red Hat OpenShift for doing source to image, that's what it stands for, uh, for taking your source code, combining it with a runtime, and then packaging that up as a Linux container image. So this is an S2I build. There are a couple of very small build scripts, essentially uh, negligible in size. And then the last layer at the top there you can see is around 209 megabytes. That is the app server. In this case, it was JBoss EAP, along with the application itself. So the app server was around 100 and, I think it was 150 megabytes, something like that, and the app was around 50 megabytes. So this is, uh, this is something you typically see in a Java EE app server Docker image. Uh, com compare and contrast that with, say, Spring Boot uh, and its fat jar uh, technology. So in this case, we still have the same kind of layers. We have an OS, we have Java, and we have the app, but they're much smaller. Um, the operating system is Alpine Linux. It's a very, very small, uh, very highly optimized for running in containers. Um, Java is still, you know, it's still pretty, pretty sizable. Um, it's been minimized somewhat in this image, but it's around 100 megabytes. But then the application itself, is, this is the fat jar, it's around 14 megabytes. So that's, that's a little bit of an improvement. So let's take another example. So Wildfly Swarm. Wildfly Swarm is a, uh, a Java uh, microservice uh, framework for Java developers. Traditionally, uh, Java EE developers have had access to a number of functionalities in Java EE app servers. Uh, Wildfly Swarm makes those, those same functionalities available, but allows you to package it into just enough app server. So only the bits that you need from the app server along with your application. So, and the result is, again, a fat jar. So this is the same exact application, uh, except it's built with, with uh, Wildfly Swarm. Uh, it's essentially the same, so we still have the same small operating system, the same small, smallish Java. Uh, but then we have two other layers here. And uh, in the demo, you'll see how these are constructed. But uh, there's a, what we call a hollow jar. That's the Wildfly Swarm runtime and then the application sits on top of that. So it's very similar to the Spring Boot example, except in the Spring Boot example, everything is packaged in one. Uh, we, in the Wildfly Swarm example, there are two different layers. The nuance of why that difference is, but it actually turns out it's not all that important uh, when talking about fat jars. So you see the very, very small application. Uh, this is literally only the bits that you type into your, into your IDE is uh, two kilobytes, right, really small. So the benefit here with Linux containers is if you change any of the layers at the bottom, Every single layer above it has to be rebuilt and redeployed and transferred across the network. If all you change is the top layer, that's the only thing that needs to actually participate in a build. Everything else is cached. Uh, you don't need to pull those other layers down when you want to deploy this to production. So putting uh, small things at the top layer and the, the, the very fast changing things, the things that you change every single day in the highest layers is very, very beneficial in the world of, of Linux containers um, and in, in container orchestration platforms like OpenShift. Okay, so let's look at the fat jar kind of hello world plus one library. So keep in mind this, this application that I built and then generated these numbers from, this is not a real world application, right? This is a hello world app. It has JAXRS in the case of Wildfly Swarm in spring. Uh, it's a very, very simple application. It just outputs one line of code. Nothing you'd ever see in production. It's very instructive to look at that because that is where you kind of filter out all of the noise from real world applications to get to the technology itself and to compare them and contrast them and, and show how you can build them in different ways. So you can see the sizes of this Hello World fat jar across the different technologies here. So Wildfly Swarm comes in at around 45 megabytes, Spring Boot 17, Drop Wizard 15, and Vertex at a very attractive four megabyte. Again, for fat jar, this ice difference is actually important, right? Because you're, you're transferring more bits over the network every time you rebuild the fat jar. These technologies come with additional features that people may not know about. Moving from a fat jar to away from fat jars makes a lot of sense in the containerized world because of the layering and because of the amount of change that goes into building applications, say microservice applications, they're built and deployed hundreds of times per day in a real scaled uh, production environment. So again, getting those bits at the topmost layer is super important. So let's see about uh, how we can do that. So before doing that, I want to explain some of the tech terminology I've been using, like hollow and skinny and fat and thin. We all know what fat jar is, right? That's everything. It includes the application runtime. It includes the application's dependencies and the application itself. So the application itself, the red box, this is the bits that you type into your IDE and you compile and they turn into dot class files in the Java world. The application dependencies, the direct application dependencies, are things that your app needs that the app runtime doesn't supply. So things like database drivers or uh, some library you may be using. In this case, in my Hello World example, I had a time library that made sense of the crazy Java 
dot util dot uh, date uh, fiasco in the previous JDKs or J uh, Java versions. And then finally, the, uh, the app runtime are the things that are necessary, kind of the final mile or final kilometer to get the application running on the JVM. So in a traditional Java EE world, this would be the app server. This would be the thing that uh, Java EE, either JBoss EAP or War uh, WebLogic or WebSphere or whatever. Um, so all of those combined is, is the fat jar. Uh, the thin jar, or thin war, depending on the technology you're using, that contains the app and app dependencies, but not the application runtime. The thin war or jar is not runnable on its own. You cannot run it without this other glue to actually make it run. If you try and run it, it's going to fail with some class not found exception. And then the skinny package, this is the app itself. This is a two kilobyte example in the Wildfly Swarm. Again, not runnable on its own. Uh, but also not runnable without its dependencies and with the runtime that it needs to run. Okay, so that's fat, skinny, and thin. And then the term hollow, this is essentially the application runtime itself. So in a traditional sense, the hollow application is the app server, is the Java EE app server, right? That's the app server. If you run this by itself, it will run, but it will do absolutely nothing other than initialize itself. Um, it needs applications to, to, make, to make actual business sense. Uh, but packaging it, on its own has a lot of uh, value, especially in the world of Linux containers. It's had value in the past because now you have this prepackaged thing from a vendor like Red Hat. Uh, you can ship it around, you can patch it independently of the applications themselves. So it makes a lot of sense to be able to package that separately for a number of reasons. Okay, so here's the grid of, of supported options and uh, after, our, after this slide we'll, we'll do the demo. So everybody supports FAT. Uh, that's been around forever and that's a well-known. It's, it's very easy to understand for developers and for IT operators. Uh, the, the, the ability to separate the application from the application runtime is what, is what we call thin. And those are also supported by all four of these technologies via different mechanisms. So in the Spring Boot case, there's a, a thing called a Spring Boot Thin Launcher. This is a, an experimental library uh, written by some of the Spring Boot engineers. Uh, I, I hope, hopefully we'll see that actually supported and, and put into the next version of Spring Boot, uh, ne next major version of Spring Boot, which is Spring Boot 2. Uh, which is, I think, coming out, I heard, later this year or some, sometime in the, the very near future. Uh, Wildfly Swarm actually, um, because of its Java EE heritage, Wildfly Swarm supports thin jars or thin war files natively. This is kind of the default uh, way you create applications in Java EE. Right? When you build a Java EE application, the output is a war file, which is generally pretty small. It doesn't include the app server itself. Uh, that's the, exactly what Wildfly Swarm does as well, um, and you'll see that in the demo. Uh, Vert, Vertex and Drop Wizard don't have kind of first class support for thin, the ability to separate them out, but it is possible to do that via uh, some Maven plugins and, and uh, some Maven support. So Maven has the ability to just d generate the dependencies for the app and put them in a separate directory. Then you can use Docker to kind of build those, those layers independently uh, and do it yourself. So Vertex and Drop Wizard don't necessarily have first class knowledge or, or support for it, but you can certainly do it. Then the skinny hollow uh, is kind of the super efficient packaging mechanism. And again, uh, Boot, Swarm, and Vertex all support this via different technologies. So for, for Boot and Vertex, uh, they support it through essentially Docker itself being able to create a Docker layer image uh, with the dependencies separated because Spring Boot and Vertex both know how to separate their dependencies, they just don't know how to package them up. So you use Docker to do that. Swarm has a, a, a packaging mechanism within it called Fractions. Via Fractions, you can separate the application from its direct dependencies, from the application runtime itself, and truly create all three of those layers independently with first class knowledge in the tooling for the technology, you can do all of this with Swarm without Docker, for example. So it knows about thin, it knows about skinny and hollow. These concepts are built into the project. Let's do the demo. So what we're gonna do is basically just walk through all of these technologies that I just kind of gave an outline for and um, show you how it works in the real world. Okay, so I have a number of, of projects here. Um, Apologies if this is a bit small on the left, but these are just a list of a number of projects I created to demonstrate this stuff. So let's start with uh, Fatjar, right? Everyone knows Fatjar. Um, we'll start with, uh, with Wildfly Swarm here. Um, I have a very simple application. So it's a RESTful application. It has an endpoint that which essentially just outputs that. So if I build that, Maven clean package. So what this is gonna do is invoke Wildfly Swarm. It's gonna look at, uh, find all the dependencies, package them all up into a single uh, Fatjar. Okay, so it's up here now. Uh, hopefully a little big enough to read. 
Um, so if I look at the, the results of that build, I see my fat jar here. Wait, dash 1.0, dash swarm dot jar. If I run it, Java, dash jar, target, wait, 1.0, dash swarm dot jar. It'll essentially run this very basic service, and I can hit it with uh, API slash hello. So curl HTTP PS or local host, if I can type, 880 API hello. Right, very simple. It's also using that time library, which I'll be using in a moment to show you how to separate the, uh, the dependencies from the app itself. Um, but there's a basic, um, yeah, so there's local date dot now dot get string. This is that Joda time library that I was telling you about. So a, a dependency separate from the app, but not part of the app server. Okay, so that's the fat version of a Wildfly Swarm app. So let's take a look at uh, Drop Wizard. So Drop Wizard, I also have a very simple application here. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's on uh, API Sing. So if we build that, so let's go to Drop Wizard, Maven, Clean, Package. So that built, and the, the resulting jar, uh, fat jar, as you can see here, is about 15 megabytes if I run it. So Java dash jar, oops, dash jar. If I can type again, I gotta kill this one first because it's sitting on the same port. Uh, target, target slash Java blah, blah. Oh, I gotta run it this way. It has a bit of a different way to start it up, but um, it's essentially the same thing, right? Fat jar from uh, Drop Wizard, very well known uh, technology. Again, the first to do fat jars. Um, and if I run it here, I can just do curl HTTP local host 8080. Uh, I think it's greeting. Yeah. So there's the the uh, fat jar from Drop Wizard. Again, about 15 megabytes, right? Much smaller than the Swarm version. Uh, but let's keep going. So after Drop Wizard, let's look at uh, Spring Boot. So Spring Boot, very popular, uh, actually kind of the Docker of fat jars, right? Docker made Linux containers really cool. Uh, Spring Boot made, made fat jars really cool, although, they, again, they weren't first. So I have a very simple application here. Um, it is sitting on, I believe, uh, on the root, OK. Or maybe it's greeting, I don't know. So let's build it, let's build that one. Let me stop this one. So let's go ahead and build the Spring Boot fat jar. Spring Boot fat. Maven clean package. So there's my Spring Boot fat jar. It's about 14 megabytes. And if I run that, java.jar target that. So that comes up, and I can hit that as well. Uh, localhost, I believe it's localhost. Uh, I think it's just the, yeah, it's just on the root. Uh, so there, there's my Spring Boot fat jar again, about 14 megabytes. And then the last one is Vertex. So let's take a look at Vertex. So I have a very simple vertical here, it just basically just outputs again, a very simple message. So let's build that one. So Vertex, fat, maven, clean, package. So there's my Vertex fat jar coming in at a very uh, small size, about almost four megabytes. So Java dash jar target that. So it's up and running, and I can hit that with, I believe it's also on the root right here. So that's our application. Okay, so that's that's the easy stuff, right? Now let's let's look at the more interesting things. So let's look at the thin war or thin jar. So this is the ability to separate the application bits you type in from the uh, application runtime. So here, again, with Wildfly Swarm, we'll start with Wildfly Swarm. Actually, there's nothing to do with Wildfly Swarm because, as I mentioned, um, it already natively creates that uh, thin, jar, thin jar file or war file. So you can see here, it's already created this wait dash 1.0 war, right? This is the thin app. It only contains the application. Uh, it also contains the application's dependencies. So if we look at what's inside of that, I only, it's, it's like a three, line, a three line application, but it's still about 500 and something kilobytes. So what takes up the space? Well, in this case, it's the Joda time library, right? It's sitting in there. Uh, although I've created my fat jar and it's only, it's less than a megabyte, it's still way bigger than it really should be because I only typed in one line of code, uh, yet I have a, a, a huge file that's gonna be uploaded every single time I push that. Every single time I change that one line in the code, it's gonna re-push those bits. So uh, we'll take a look at what we can do to, uh, to separate that in a moment. So, but that's the, the concept of thin in Wildfly Swarm.
So what is the difference, what is the concept of thin in, say, Spring Boot? So I have, again, an application, a simple Spring Boot application uh, with, it just outputs, it's, it's exactly the same application, but it's built slightly differently. So let me build it and I'll show you what happens here. So Maven clean package. So again, it's, it's building the application with Spring Boot, but it's doing it in a slightly different way. And if we take a look, before I show you the application, or the, the result, if we take a look at the POM file in the, the thin version of Spring Boot, uh, let me make this a bit bigger here. So we have the, the, the traditional uh, um, dependencies for Spring Boot. Uh, we, have, uh, it, we pull in the, the starters that we need. We have the web starter here. We have our Jota time library there. We also have the, uh, the Spring Boot Maven plugin, uh, but we also have a dependency within that Spring Boot Maven plugin, which creates what's known as a, a new layout for, uh, for the resulting application using the, what we call the Spring Boot Thin uh, uh, layout or Spring Boot Thin plugin. Uh, so that's essentially all I've added to my, to, my, uh, to my POM file. And so what happened when I built that, if we go into the directory where the thing is created, you can see I now have a thin jar file. I don't have the fat jar file. It's about 11 kilobytes. Uh, the dependencies themselves are actually in a directory here called thin. And what this is actually is is a Maven repository, a local Maven repository. So if you look at what's in that uh, directory, it's essentially a Maven repository with all of its dependencies from the application itself. So uh, if I run this, java-jar greeting spring boot thin, it's, it's a runnable thin jar, right? Which is slightly different from, from Wildfly Swarm. Oh, I think I have something already on running here. I gotta kill that one, try that again. So it's actually resolving its dependencies from that local Maven repository that was created as part of this uh, plugin. So the application runs, I can, I can hit it on you know, curl, I can show you that, but I, I assume you believe me by now. Uh, but it's, 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 it's resolved those dependencies. So what, what you can do is to create a Docker image is take that thin layer, combine it with the application itself, Docker in a Docker file. So I have a Docker file here, which is very simple. Um, it basically adds two files to the, to the Docker uh, image. It adds a, the dependencies from this thin directory, and then it adds the application itself. So if I Docker build this, Docker, let's see, Docker build, I'll call it uh, spring, Docker build. So you can see, it actually, because I haven't actually made any changes uh, to the application, it used the cached version of this, of the dependencies. So the Docker build was very fast. The only thing that was added to the directory here was, was uh, my actual application itself. If I make a change to this application, say uh, from Java 1, save that and rebuild it. Maven clean package. Rebuild the application, which rebuilds everything, the dependencies and the application. But then when I, create, when I rebuild the Docker image, it goes very fast. And the only thing that was added that was not cached was the application itself, right? The, the dependencies haven't changed. It was able to use the cache uh, within the Docker registry and then rebuild it very quickly. And then I can run it uh, using run hp8080 to expose the port, which it, oops. So I can run this within the Docker image and then essentially do the, it will do exactly the same thing. It'll, it'll expose that on a port and I can hit that on local host 8080 and I get my Spring Boot thin jar. Uh, did I change the wrong file here? Yes. Okay, I, I believe that I changed the wrong file. Yeah, this is the one I needed to change. From Java 1. So that was the default. Yeah, let me, let me rebuild this. Spring Boot thin. Docker build. Rebuilt, and then I'll rerun it, hopefully, and I will get the message I was expecting, which has the Java 1 uh, string in it. I just changed the wrong file here. So let's hit it again, and it didn't work. Okay, so what did I not do right here? Spring Boot thin, Docker build, Docker run. Oh, I didn't rebuild it. That would help. So you actually have to build the application itself to, to, to compile the, the, the bytecode into the thin um, layer and then re rebuild the Docker image and then rerun it. Okay, 
Let's see if this works. If this doesn't work, then I'll give up. OK, so there's the image. So essentially, I, I made a one line change to the file. It only resulted in about 11 kilobytes of change instead of the 15 or 16 megabytes of change that would have resulted if I was building a fat jar. So very, very powerful mechanism for saving a lot of sanity in IT departments. OK, so that's Spring Boot Thin. Now let's take a look at uh, Vertex Thin, and then we'll go get to Wildfly Swarm, which is a very interesting use case. OK, so for Vertex, Vertex Thin, so if you remember from the, the graph, um, Vertex Thin is actually supported through Docker. So uh, what that means is I actually have a Docker file, which is pulling from a pre-built Docker image. This is a, pre a Docker image that the Vertex project makes available to me. This is essentially representing the app runtime, right? This is Vertex core plus a couple of other dependencies. Um, this is how I get the notion of a thin, uh, fi a thin application in Vertex. So when I built this, uh, I just built it, the, the actual application itself is only about four kilobytes or three kilobytes, very small. Um, the fat jar, again, if you recall, is four megabytes. So there's a pretty significant order of magnitude difference between the thin jar of my application and the fat jar in Vertex world. So to, to realize this with Docker, again, I have this Docker file. It essentially just adds um, the vertical. It, it's, because it's getting Vertex from, from the, the base image, it's only adding the jar file itself, the application itself. So if I then do, do build this one, docker build t vertex latest dot. So again, it's just adding my application here. Then I can run that, docker run dash it dash p8080. And then, oh, I got something running. So I still have my Spring Boot app running. So let me kill that, run this again. So it's, it's already up and running. It's super fast. Vertex is one of the fastest starting applications in the world, in my opinion. Uh, then if I can hit it on local host, so there's my Vertex thin jar application. Again, if I were to make a single line change to the application and rebuild it, the exact same thing from Spring Boot would happen. Uh, I would only get you know, a couple of kilobytes of change in the Docker layer. Everything else would be cached and, uh, sa and saving me network, compute, and storage, and saving my AWS bill. OK, so that's Vertex. So let's take a look at, the last one we're going to look at is uh, Wildfly Swarm. So we already talked about Wildfly Swarm fat jars. That's pretty, cl pretty clear. Uh, we talked about Wildfly Swarm thin wars, which is essentially coming from its Java EE heritage. So let's talk about skinny and hollow. So uh, in the Wildfly Swarm case, it has this concept of fractions. So if you recall from the earlier uh, discussion, in the, when I built the, the thin jar, or the thin war of, uh, of Wildfly Swarm, uh, it contained 500 kilobytes of bits. That's way too big, right? This should be very small. Dot o dot jar. Oops, jar. So target. So there's. Oh man, let me try that again. Uh, there. Okay. So here's my my thin application in Wildfly Swarm, right? Here's my application itself, which is like one kilobyte. And then here's this humongous library, 630 kilobytes, right? That, that's, that's pretty expensive when you scale to the scale of HubSpot or Google, who does 2 billion deploys per week. Uh, that adds up quickly. Not only that, this is a hello world application. In a real world application, you're going to have fat jars that get up to, in the HubSpot case, their fat jars, real world application, right? Successful company, 200 megabytes was their fat jar size. That's one of the reasons why their bill was so huge. So you can really easily get up to large fat jars it makes a lot of sense for developers, but it, it, it is a death knell to, yeah, two minutes? All right, cool. So it's, it's, it's bad for, uh, for IT departments. So with Swarm, what we can do is do what's called a skinny. So let me build it and just uh, describe what's happening here. So uh, actually, in order to get rid of that library and all the libraries that I eventually add, I need to create a fraction. This is a first class citizen in Swarm. So I actually created a fraction for this Joda time library. So I do maven clean package install. And while it's building, I'll quickly show you what it looks like. It's a very simple, it's it got very little code in it. In fact, it has almost no code in it. It has a single kind of um, uh, class that, that tells Wildfly Swarm that this is a fraction. Uh, it sends from this fraction class. And then it has a module file uh, which describes it, its class dependencies itself. This is a, a JBoss modules uh, module. This is a technology coming from, from the JBoss world, brought into Wildfly Swarm, makes it possible to create these fractions. 
So if I look at the, if I then, so I've built my fraction, I've installed it. Now I want to go ahead and build the application using that fraction. So I have a skinny application here. If we look at the POM file, it's got a dependency on my Joda fraction that I created. This is separate from my application. It's not built with the application. It's brought in as part of the swarm runtime. So let's go ahead and build that. So if I go to skinny, maven, clean package, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get that hollow uh, jar file. It's runnable, but it doesn't do anything on its own. So I just built it. Now you can see I have this hollow swarm file. This is the original. This is the uh, this is Wildfly Swarm minus the application, uh, but adds that that Joda uh, fraction that I talked about. So now I've packaged all of my app's dependencies plus the runtime into this hollow swarm file. I can then run this this tiny, tiny, tiny application. This is the bits that I've typed into my IDE. That's only two kilobytes, right? I've now separated them out. So now I can then again with Docker. Uh, I can uh, build JHF Swarm latest. I can then put, oh boy, docker build dash T. I can then put those separate uh, bits into separate, separate layers. So here you can see the hollow swarm was added as one layer, and then my application itself was added as a separate layer. When I make a one line change to the application, that is the only thing that's going to change. Nothing else will change. The application runtime, Wildfly Swarm in this case, will not change. It will not be re-downloaded. It will not be redeployed. It will always be cached. And you save a ton of money on network compute and disk again. So last thing, I'll just run it. Actually, um, let, me, yeah, let me go ahead and run it real quick, and then we'll, then we'll finish up. Docker run dash it uh, dash p 8080 8080. Uh, okay, I got something else running, so let me kill that. Try it one more time. Oops, I just built it again. Okay, last one here. This is the, the money shot here. So it's running uh, Wildfly Swarm, but then bringing in that, that application separately because the, the application is now split from the, from the application runtime. If I then curl it, uh, API hello. So it's there. This is the skinny jar uh, using that externalized library put into a separate Docker layer. And it's very powerful. So that's the, kind of the rundown. Uh, last thing is the, uh, the kind of re packaging recommendations. So fat apps, fat jars work well. People understand those. Uh, for small applications, it makes sense. But you very quickly, if you're building a real world application at scale, you're going to get into a situation where you have 100 megabytes of a fat jar. That multiplied by the number of nodes that you have and the, the resulting storage necessary and network transfers costs a lot of money. So that's when you're going to start wanting to consider splitting the application out of a fat jar into a thin or hollow jar or war file um, and separating those into separate layers so that you can save money. Uh, HubSpot is a great example of this. They actually did their homegrown solution, but with, with Wildfly Swarm and Spring Boot and Verdex and, and Drop Wizard, you have kind of options in the projects themselves, supported options from the projects. And in, in Red Hat's case, we're supporting these through the Red Hat uh, app, OpenShift application runtimes. Uh, you can do this on your own using uh, support uh, from a vendor like Red Hat. So that's it. Um, thanks for hanging out. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around. Um, but thank you.